Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. That's the walk of faith. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, over to the book of Revelation. We're looking at Laodicea. We're in the second half of this series on Laodicea. The first half was looking at how bad they were and all the things that are wrong that you shouldn't do. But now the question is, how to avoid become like Laodicea? And we're in uh, part seven of the series, and this is session number four in the second half of the series. Revelation chapter three. Of course, you know, for the last two weeks we had a guest speaker, and so uh, church number seven, part six, Laodicea was August 26th, last time we were there. So September 16th, Church at Laodicea, part seven. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, Because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. They didn't even have air conditioning back then. (laughs) They have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. That thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thyself, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, Jesus loved even that church. As many as I love, I rebuke. And chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. What a promise to Laodicea. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Father, we pray for your blessing upon your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, what we've seen so far as we've looked at Laodicea is that this is clearly a church of true believers because Jesus talks about how he loves them, but it was an entire church that was out of fellowship. Christ's invitation to open the door is not an offer of salvation, it's an offer of fellowship. I will come in and sup with him and he with me. A church of true believers, but totally out of fellowship, because those in fellowship become hot for Christ. What we've learned so far is that fellowship with Christ is one of the key requirements for the victorious Christian life. Without it, a church becomes lukewarm like Laodicea. Constant spiritual growth is essential to avoid becoming like Laodicea. Fellowship with Christ is the first key to spiritual growth, but Laodicea had lost it. They were saved but totally carnal. We've learned that spiritual growth comes through a series of systematic steps. Number one, the believer's new life begins at the moment of salvation or the spiritual birth of John 3. You must be born again. You obviously can't grow spiritually unless you're born again. The two elements of being born again are the new life is received by faith in Christ as personal Savior, not as some kind of a generic Savior, not an institutional Savior, not a grandma's Savior, but personal Savior. And secondly, the believer receives a new spiritual birth the moment he or she genuinely trusts in Christ of Scripture, the God-man, 
who died for our sins on Calvary's cross, who was buried and literally and bodily rose again from the dead. Absolutely essential. And spiritual growth begins immediately after spiritual birth. The third thing that we learn is that spiritual growth is required. It is not an option for an obedient Christian. There are two reasons that spiritual growth is not optional. First, spiritual growth is commanded by God. That's rather serious. Since God commands us to do it, that means that this is the human side of the equation. You have a responsibility. God expects us to be actively involved in spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is not passive, just like physical growth is not passive. <clears throat> to grow physically, you need food. <clears throat> that means your hand is going to stick it into your mouth. You need exercise. If you want to grow, you've got to move your muscles in your body. If you lie on bed all day long, you may get fat, but you're not going to do anything. But you do need some rest, so you do have to spend some time lying on your bed. To grow spiritually, you need spiritual food, and the Word of God makes it clear that Scripture is our spiritual food. Your exercise is putting the things that you learn from Scripture into practice. And your rest is your meditation on the Word of God and your prayer times. The second reason that spiritual growth is not an option is because spiritual growth is accomplished by the Spirit of God as we yield to Him and follow His direction. That's the divine side of the equation. There are certain things that you cannot do that only God can do to bring about spiritual growth in the life of the believer. We've studied many verses, of course, related to our personal responsibility, the human side, what God commands us to do. And that's where we finished last time together, so we won't repeat the verses again. That brings us to the second half of the spiritual growth principles. That is, the half where spiritual growth is accomplished by the Spirit of God as we yield to Him and obey His direction. Let's look at some of the verses related to God's responsibility, the divine side, what God has promised that He Himself will do. The first set of verses comes to us from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, you've heard me talk about the difference between Christian liberty and licentiousness or libertinism. Liberty is the supernatural divine power that God gives to us to do what we ought to do, not what we want to do. When you get into what you want to do, that's the flesh manifesting itself. Christian liberty is the ability which the unbeliever does not have it is the divine enablement or empowerment to do what God designed us to do and empowers us and motivates us to do. When you're doing what God designed you to do, that's when you are truly free. That's when you have genuine liberty. A plane is not fleet free when it's just taxiing down the runway. It's really free when it takes off and it goes through the air. It's doing what it was designed to do. You don't drive an airplane from New York City to San Antonio, Texas on the ground. That would cause all kinds of chaos all over the United States and it probably wouldn't make it. You're only free when you're doing what God designed you to do and the only way you can do that is by the power of the Spirit of God. So that's what this first verse is saying. Now the Lord is that Spirit and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, verse 18. But we all with open face, in other words, this doesn't happen to you while you're asleep, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. You've got a mirror. You see the glory of the Lord shining in the mirror. And God begins to do something. He begins to transform you. We're changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You can't do that. That's what God does. But the first verse 
applies first. Christian liberty is doing in the power of the Spirit what God designed you to do. And as you do that, God the Spirit begins to transform your life and you can see it happening. It's like you're looking in the mirror and you see it's actually taking place as you transform from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit does that. Second passage I want us to look at, which deals with the second half of spiritual growth principles, the, the side accomplished by God as we yield to him and follow his directions, is Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. You all know this passage. It's the passage that deals with the fruit of the Spirit. It's essential because a growing Christian will be manifesting the fruit not that you work up. It's not the plastic bananas that you hang on the pine tree in your backyard. The fruit of the Spirit. It's what the Holy Spirit produces in the life of the yielded believer who is walking by faith and obeying what God has commanded him to do, and suddenly the fruit comes from inside, because the Spirit indwells you, comes from inside, and it begins to go out to the branches, and it begins to flower and bud, and suddenly the fruit begins to grow. The fruit of the Spirit is love. You know, that's one of the things that the church at Ephesus had lost, hadn't it? They were very good at the mechanics. But the very first manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit had been lost by a doctrinally sound church. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. You know when there's real joy and not just plastic smiles. You know when people who are filled with the Holy Spirit radiate the joy of Christ, even sometimes in very difficult circumstances. In fact, joy in the New Testament is most frequently seen against the darkest backgrounds of suffering. Peace. Some of you here tonight have some agitation going on in your life. There's an area of life where you're not yielding to the Spirit of God because you don't have peace. As you yield to the Spirit of God, regardless of circumstances, he gives you peace. My peace, Jesus said, I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Now that was at a critical juncture in the life of Christ and the disciples. He tells that to them in the upper room discourse just before he goes to the cross. Circumstances indicate panic. Circumstances would require running away. But Jesus says, I give you my peace. I'm going away, but I'm going to come back. You're going to weep and cry, but then you're going to rejoice. And you know that peace that they had took them through the most intense persecutions where they were all martyred except for John on the Isle of Patmos. You can't work that up. You can't go into a transcendental meditation trance and go, mm, and get God's peace. The Holy Spirit, as you yield to him and as you obey his direction, begins to produce this in and through you as he manifests his character and the character of Christ in your life. Love joy, peace, long-suffering. We've talked about that. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. You know them, nine. It's the ninefold fruit, singular. 
as the fruit begins to develop in your life, not just one area of the fruit will develop. It's not the fruits of the Spirit, it's the fruit of the Spirit. And all ninefold fruit aspects will begin to show up in your life. Only the Spirit of God can do that. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Ah, so now we have some of our responsibility. Have you crucified the flesh? You know, crucifixion is not instantaneous death. Crucifixion is a long, painful, agonious death. There were people whom the Romans crucified who lasted days and days and days and days before they died. We have an obligation to crucify the flesh. The flesh doesn't like it. The flesh keeps screaming and yelling. The flesh wants to keep coming down off the cross. The flesh is your enemy. You don't want it loose and running around. You got enemies, the world, the flesh, the devil, the demons. The one that you can crucify, you can't crucify the world, can't crucify the devil, can't crucify the demons. God gives you other means of dealing with them, but the flesh, you have an obligation to crucify. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh. And that means the things that are manifest by the flesh, its affections, the things that the flesh loves, and its lusts, the inordinate desires that the flesh always wants to get involved in. And you say no to it. You slam the door, you lock the door, you nail it up, you don't let it get out. If we live in the Spirit, and that is a fact. That's an if, and it is so. There are different kinds of if clauses in Scripture. This is if, and it is so. If we live in the Spirit, <clears throat> you do, because you are permanently indwelt by the Spirit. Then let us also walk in the Spirit. You cannot walk in the Spirit unless you have crucified the flesh, unless you are walking by faith. And as you do, the first two verses in this passage, it's all tied together, begin to manifest in your life the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Three trilogies, even as there is a trinity in your being and in the divine Godhood, Godhead. The third passage we want to look at is Ephesians chapter 3. Again, spiritual growth accomplished by the Spirit of God as we yield to him and follow his directives. Ephesians 3, beginning in verse 16. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. Now, you're already indwelt by the Spirit of God. But the Holy Spirit also does a special work of giving you strength, internal strength. You may be a 90-pound weakling, but the Spirit of God, and I think Paul was like a 90-pound weakling, the Spirit of God gave him internal strength where he could keep pushing through and pushing through because Christ was central in his life and the Spirit of God kept him going. You read over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 where Paul lists all the different things that he had to go through and you'll say, how did a 90-pound weakling who was probably in his late 50s or early 60s do that? We're strengthened by the Spirit of God. You can't work it up. You can't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. Now he explains some of the ways that this takes place. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints 
What is the breadth and length and depth and height? There's going to come some understanding when you begin to allow the Spirit of God to give you this strength. You're going to comprehend. That means you're going to understand with all the other believers what is the breadth, that's how wide, the length, how far this direction, the depth, how far down that way, the height, how far up. How big is that? He's talking about the love of Christ. That tells you in the next verse. How big is the love of Christ? You're going to start understanding it. As the Spirit of God works in your life to give you inner strength. As you begin to yield to the Spirit of God, you begin to understand how much Jesus did for you. And not to take it lightly, but to be awed, to be humbled in the presence of God our Savior. He tells you that in verse 19 and following, to know the love of Christ. Yes, we know God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We all know the verse. Do you understand? Do you know the length and the depth and the height and the breadth of the love of Christ? As you begin to grow spiritually, this is something that God is going to impress upon your life. You'll begin to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. You'll never get to the end of how great the love of Christ is. You can keep going that direction as far as you want. You'll never get to the end of it. You can keep going that direction as far as you want. You'll never get to the end of it. You can keep going these directions as far as you want. You'll never get to the end of it. You can keep going up as far as you want. You'll never get to the end of it. You can keep plumbing the depths as far as you want. You'll never get to the end of it. That you may be to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. God wants you to be full of the Spirit. In fact, it's commanded. Ephesians 5.18 Be filled with the Spirit. There are many works that the Spirit of God does automatically, and you have no part in it. The Holy Spirit is your earnest. The Holy Spirit is the one who guides, who leads, who directs. The Spirit of God convicts of sin. The Holy Spirit of God does many, many things in your life. But there's one where you are given a command. Be filled with the Spirit. Now you know, all you ladies know this. In your cupboards there are different sized glasses. There are different sized jars perhaps. There are maybe some small plastic containers. I've got some that are this little. They hold only like one ounce. I've got some that are great big, huge jugs. You know what? That little teeny container doesn't hold as much as the big container, but I can fill it. If I put that amount that's in the little container in the big container, it's not full. Each one of us in our spiritual lives has grown in our capacity to receive more and more and more. Suppose you started out as a one-quart mason jar and you can be full. But suppose you're a very flexible mason jar and it begins to grow like a balloon and you can get more and more. And suppose through some process of of growth of this flexible material, you are able to grow even bigger to where your wheelbarrow size. And then you grow to the size of your local water tower. You can hold a lot of water. And then you grow to the size of some massive swimming pool. And then you grow to the size of some lake somewhere. But you still can't hold the ocean. But you can be full. Whatever your spiritual growth size is at your point right now, you're responsible for being filled with the Spirit. 
You take the stopper off the top. You let him fill your life. Now, he indwells you already. But being filled with the Spirit means having everything about you under his control. The filling of the Spirit deals with the control of the Spirit. So that means he is controlling your mouth, what you say. He is controlling your thoughts, what you think about 24 hours a day. He is controlling what you do. Every decision you make that manifests itself in visible action, he controls it. He controls every motive, why you choose to do the things you want to do. All of it. He controls your attitudes. Well, you may do it, but you don't do it very cheerfully. Five areas, five areas where the Holy Spirit is in total control. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Are we being filled every day? When you understand the love of Christ, the more you understand of his love, it's a love that passes knowledge, so you can never get all of it. But as you do, you grow, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. It's not you doing it, it's he is doing it. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. You can't even realize how much he can do in your life. He could take any person in this auditorium tonight or listening over the internet and do with you the most incredible things that you can't even imagine right now. I like to talk about it as potential. I tried to teach my children Go for the maximum potential that God has given to you. Don't compare yourself to other people. What is God doing in your life? And reach the maximum potential in the years that God gives you to live. Reach the maximum potential of what you can live for Christ. And that's where joy and peace is found. That's where the fruit of the Spirit abounds in every area of your life. That's where the Holy Spirit fills you and controls your thoughts, your words, your actions, your motives, your attitudes. He can do abundantly above all that you ask or think. You know, oh Lord, use me. And then we think about some Mickey Mouse little thing that, yeah, God, if you could just use me to do this little winky dinky thing. And God says, boy, that sure is a puny little request. I can do more than you ever asked for. In fact, I can do more than you ever thought about, that ever crossed your mind. In spiritual growth, this is something the Spirit of God does. But you must be yielded and open and obedient. And you must be a clean vessel to be filled and used for the master's service. A clean vessel. According to the power that worketh in us, that is the indwelling Spirit of God, here's the work that God the Holy Spirit is doing in your life and mine. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. In the final verse, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Here's the work of God. This is not what you crank up. Philippians 2, 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Did you know that when you yield to the Spirit of God, he can change your will. 
He can direct your will so that you want to do what He wants you to do. And He doesn't just stop with this, oh, pie in the sky, your eyes are sort of cast up there and thinking, man, I'd sure like to do this for Jesus. Both to will and, what are the next two words? To do. To do. He can give you the drive and the desire, not just to want to do it, but the Spirit of God, if this is the will of God, will empower you to do His will. That is so exciting to me because it means it's not up to me as long as I'm yielded to the Spirit of God working in my life. What? Right now. Think about it. What has God called you to do right now? Think about it. What's the last time you thought about what's the new exciting thing that God wants me to do? I think all of us have some things that we know God wants us to do. Your job is to yield and obey. His job is to empower. And then by his power, through you, to accomplish his will. That is so freeing because this is God's part. Our responsibility is just to yield and obey. And then God makes it possible and gives us the energy and the strength and opens the doors where there were closed doors and works out precise timing and precisely accomplishes what he wanted from eternity past to transpire on earth for his glory, our good, and the testimony of Jesus Christ. We don't have to panic because the fruit of the Spirit is beginning to work in us. There's love, joy, and there's peace. As you move forward into what looks look like impossible odds, but you know this is the will of God. You're empowered by the Spirit of God. He's motivated you to will this, and now he empowers you to do this. What freedom. There's Christian liberty. There's the plane flying through the air, not dri driving along on the ground. Freedom is where God, the Holy Spirit, empowers you to do what you ought to do. It's not the so-called freedom to do what you want to do, where the old flesh is manifesting itself. Obviously, only God can do those things that we've just talked about here, but there must be a connection between the human side of responsibility, that is, the side that engages our regenerated will, and the divine side of sovereignty. So God gives commands. He expects obedience. That means we are accountable. And yes, I believe in the absolute sovereignty of God. But God gives commands, and he is not giving commands just to laugh at us while we can't do it. Because God says, you yield to me, and I will give you the power to do it, because I will use you as a vessel for my glory. You better be a pure vessel, but I will use you for my glory. And the Spirit of God cleanses us when we confess our sins. The Spirit of God repairs us when we repent from our sins. The Spirit of God fills us after we've been repaired and uses us and causes us to grow and we can be filled with more and more and more and we can never reach the end. I mean, that's incredible, dear people. What God is willing to do with us, little piddly squat people, no count with the rest of the world, but God could take any person in this room or watching on the internet, and if you follow these principles, you will never be like the church at Laodicea. That's number one. That's the whole point of all of this. But number two, he can use you like you have never imagined in your life. Do you want to be used by God? Some of us are getting older. We don't have that many years to go. Are we going to make it count? 
We have responsibility because we've got commands. But we also can relax because God is the one that does, us, does it in us and through us for his own glory. There has to be a connection between the human side of responsibility, that's the side that engages our regenerated will, and the divine side of sovereignty. So what does the Bible say about the connection between the two sides so that power flows through the circuit? In other words, how does God, we're going to talk about the hows now, how does God tell us to activate our side of the equation, the switches that God uses to bring about spiritual growth? You say, okay, yeah, I mean, I understand I'm supposed to do this. How am I going to do it? Well, we're going to talk about that. We understand God can do his thing, and he didn't have to, nobody has to explain to him how to do it. But we need to understand how to activate the switches over on our side. There are several switches that the Holy Spirit uses. In other words, the Holy Spirit uses specific means of growth where he has commanded us to be involved. First area. We're going to hold, give you a whole list of them. First area is continual reading of the Bible and continued obedience to it. Reading of the Bible, I would say more meditation on the Bible. And then you've got to obey what you read. You don't just say, well, I knocked off my 15 verses for today, so I guess I'll do something else. You forget exactly what you just read. In fact, you can't even remember the next day where you've been reading. Matthew 4.4, 4. but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's what your Bible is. Every word has proceeded out of the mouth of God, and he gave it through his amanuensis, the various apostles and prophets, so that you would have it today. Get those three words. Man shall not live. Now we're not just talking about the opposite of death and life, but you're going to live every day. You live by the Bible. You live by its precepts. You're not just alive because of it. Yes, we know. We read the scriptures and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and so we got alive we're born again now we're talking about growth man shall not live by bread alone you don't just eat one loaf of bread and expect to last for the rest of your life you shall not live every day you're living you're living you're living your life goes on until God takes you home you got to have the Bible every day. You've got to be living by the Bible every day. You eat three meals a day. You ought to have a good, solid intake of the Bible. Hey, how about three times a day? Do any of us do that? Now, I know I'm a professional, and so i got to do that. But that's not just my job. I'm talking about spiritual growth. Do you do it? Are you constantly meditating on the Word of God? You know the best way to meditate is to memorize. Memorize scripture and then throughout the day it comes to your mind. You know, memorizing good solid hymns is one of those ways too. Get hymns that are theologically accurate. Don't get some junky modern stuff. I, I wake up in the middle of the night and I'll have hymns running through my head or some Bible passage running through my head. And I say, whoa, was that going through my head while I was asleep? Yeah. I'll be riding down the road to in total silence because I'm out of range of some classical station, so I'm just riding in total silence. I had a lot of hours on the road. And you know what? I had Bible verses running through my head most of that time and music running through my head, hymns. And sometimes I'd sing them out loud because I'm driving down the road and there's nothing else to do. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That's a daily, multiple times per day intake so that you can have an output of life. Philippians 2.12 Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, 
Ah, so it looks like there's going to be a responsibility here. As you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. You know, I had some kids, now they all got better at this as time went along, but I had some kids that when I was around, they always did exactly what I told them. When I wasn't there, they didn't do exactly as I told them. They changed the game plan. Paul says to the Philippians, that was a good church. As you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Now here is a phrase that people have really bent out of shape. But it's key to what we're understanding here. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And people who believe in work salvation jump on that verse and they say, well, you see, you've got to work it out. Uh, yeah, 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 you figure out what to do and then, then you go out and you do it and you get saved. That's not what this verse says. It's the outworking of your salvation. Because you are saved, there are certain things that will work out of your life. It will come from the life that is within and begin to pour out to others the outworking of your salvation. And you know what? You don't take it for granted. He tells you to do it with fear and trembling because the flesh is always trying to get in the way. That's why you got to crucify the flesh with affections and lusts because the flesh is always going to be there trying to push you off the track. You're trying to outwork your salvation. You're focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the flesh comes along with some little goat on the side and sticks out a big, fat, hairy toe, and you trip over it. James 1. And here we go again. The reading and meditation on the Bible and obedience to it. James 1, beginning in verse 21. Wherefore, Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. I love that phrase. <laughs> it means all this overflowing of all the wicked garbage that pours out of your heart. Get rid of it. Lay it apart. How do you do it? Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But it doesn't stop there. As you begin to take in scripture, it's going to scrub you clean. Peter talks about the washing of the water of the word. That's going to get rid of all of this filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, this overflowing of wicked things that are in your life. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. There we have the born again part. But look at verse 22. It doesn't stop there. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. You say, well, I read my Bible verses for today. I, I'm a pretty good hearer of the word. I'm listening to what you say, God. God says, okay, how has it changed your life? What difference has it made in your life? Look at the last phrase. Deceiving your own selves. You can talk the talk, but if you don't walk the walk, the only person you're deceiving is yourself. Everybody else knows you're not walking the walk. Because you've heard it, you may be able to spout it back, but you have not yet obeyed it. As you meditate on the Word of God, as the fruit of the Spirit begins to develop in your life, you begin to obey what God shows you. You yield to Him, and the Spirit of God begins to work inside you, and you begin to do an outworking of the salvation that you have. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, that is a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. You know, there are some mornings that I've gotten up and man, I'm running late and I'm tired, usually tired, you know, got waste, too many things going on. And I go in there and I splash some more on my face and I look in the mirror and I, I sort of notice that my beard needs trimming. It hasn't been trimmed in a couple of days or maybe I got a lot of hair here under my throat. And you know, I think I don't have time to shave right now. And I run out the door. And you know what? Five minutes later, I am not thinking about my beard. 
I'm not thinking about a smudge on my face that I say, oh man, I've got to wash that off. And then I get busy, I hear the phone ring or something. I forget immediately what I look like to everybody else. That's what he says, when you're a hearer of the word and not a doer, you're like the guy who looks in the mirror, you, hold, you behold yourself, you go your way, straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. Ah, here we go again. The idea of Christian liberty. What is the law of liberty? I thought liberty was contrary to law, right? No, there's a law of liberty. Law is the organized structure and pattern by which we regulate our lives in a social context so that we most perfectly accomplish the goals of the social context in which we find ourselves. In this case, the social context is God. Liberty is not the freedom to do what you want. It's the power to do what you ought to do. Looking in to the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. You don't just say, okay, five minutes I'm going to give. God, here's your five minutes. Get the stop, stopwatch out. Continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer like the guy who looked in the mirror and saw his face and walked away and forgot it, but a doer of the work. In other words, he's starting to shave. This man shall be blessed in his deed. God will take your works and he'll make them all fit together. Now we're going to talk about prayer as one of these responsibilities, how we can activate our side of the equation. But it fits in at this point, so let me just give you the illustration. Martin Luther, as you might expect, was a very busy man. And he didn't have a cell phone. And he didn't have a motorcycle or a car. And he certainly didn't have roads that he could ride those things on. He had to either walk or ride a horse or ride in a carriage. And carriages don't go very fast. But what did he accomplish? Calvin the same way. Zwingli, Ulrich Zwingli. How about Jan Hus? These men had nothing of the things that we have today. They had no mass communications. The best distance communication was where you're on one top of a mountain and somebody else on the next mountain and you're holding up signal tor torches. You can't talk very fast that way. You sure can't do it with your thumbs. And yet look what God did through those men. They didn't have typewriters. They didn't even have ballpoint pens. They had feathers with a little split on the end that they dink, dipped in an inkwell and then they wrote. Massive amounts they wrote. And it changed the world. Incredible as we think about that. He continues in the perfect law of liberty, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Well, our time is up. There's a lot more under the first section, which is continually reading and meditating on the Bible and continually obeying it. And then we get to the second power switch, which is unceasing prayer. How do you pray all the time? We'll talk about that, the Lord willing, next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the one who empowers. We have some responsibilities for obedience, but you give us the power to do it. We have some responsibilities for studying, but you're the one that gives us understanding. We have responsibilities for meditating upon the Bible and obeying it, but you're the one who opens the doors so that we can do it. You're the God who has set before each one of us an infinite potential. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. We can't even imagine what you could do with puny, weak, little vessels like us with physical problems and family problems and all kinds of problems. But if we yield to the Spirit of God, 
if we obey his direction, which will always be in harmony with the word of God, you will give us power, you'll develop fruit, you'll manifest forth your glory, and nothing can stop the Spirit of God when he begins to move. And Father, we pray for his movement in this church. We pray that you will motivate each one of us to be obedient, to study your word, to have a regular intake whereby we're not just knocking off verses, but whereby we are studying and praying for understanding so that we might obey. Thank you, Father, for your word tonight. We pray that you'll take it and apply it to our hearts, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight, if I can get my finger over there, 